happening. I gotta say, this is the honor of a lifetime to be with you on the show that's about to blow up. This is about to just launch oh. your Twitch, your Facebook Live career sky high, my friend. Oh, thank you very because much. Because I'm here with you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This is the make or break episode for us. And uh, Absolutely. If this flops, and it won't flop because we got the boys. Of course. Uh, it, it's over for you. I'm sorry, Jack. It was a good <laughs> run. You've been doing great work, but you're going to have to like be a librarian if this doesn't go well tonight. You know, so it, the pressure's on. Pressure's uh, on you. Pressure's not on me. It's on uh, you. I were, and uh, we dropped a little bit on the, the, the intro there, and I was like, oh, no, here we go again. Uh, but we're live. We're ready to go. We haven't had any issues so far, so that's a good thing. Um, they're just pulling this up here, making sure – doing going to do a lot of monitoring today to make sure everything was good. But I played a lot around with the video settings that you had, uh, had let me know about. You said, hey, try doing this, try doing that. And I think one of your strategies worked. I did something else to um, kind of help it. But – uh, I think everything's working so far. So thank you, my friend, for that. Look at uh, that. My, my degree coming in real <laughs> life use. I knew it wasn't going to be an issue. Take that, dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so you need lawyers when you can help Twitch streamers out. I think, you know, what we'll do is we'll just start right off the top and explain your background. Um as you mentioned, technologically speaking, but also in the sporting world. Um, a graduate of New Milford High School, go Green Wave, uh, mm -hmm. on to the great university that is West Con. And you kind of worked your way up in the rankings, and I know exactly how that is. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story, your background, how you got involved with sports, sports media specifically. So uh, there's a bit of a chapter that you skip there. It's a very short chapter in that um, I was actually up at Syracuse University for the fall freshman semester. So it was mm -hmm. 2016, the fall then, I think, if I'm remembering rightly, or 2015. I was there for a whole semester. I was there for secondary education, and it was just not for me. I thought I wanted to be a history teacher. I thought I wanted... Uh, you know, to, to educate and brighten the youths of tomorrow. And then I realized the youth of tomorrow are doomed. Uh, so I got out of there as quickly as possible. Um, actually, uh, it was some health issues that kind of brought me back mm. to the Western Connecticut area. I originally intended on going to West Con just to keep up with like gen ed courses. Uh, it's a bit of a cheaper school than Syracuse. Uh, it being, you know, a public university, that sort of thing. And I was still like exploring options going into my college career, if you will. Um, I didn't know if I wanted to do theater or like media, whether that be television, radio, etc. And I took a like Radio 100 class mm -hmm. that was it was like fundamentals of radio or something like that. And the first night we were there, it was a two hour long course because I only met once a week. And the first night we were there. The sports director at the time, he goes by the name of Chris Walker. Uh, you may know him from Westerners broadcast, from WXC mm -hmm. broadcast. He worked at ESPN for a little bit. I'm not sure where he is now. Uh, but he was like, hey, uh, we're looking for um, a color commentator for the basketball game tomorrow night, women's basketball, 5 p.m. over at the O'Neill Center. And like everyone is kind of quiet, you know, because we're all freshmen and, you know, some people are just there because they think it's an easy course, that sort of thing. And my ears perked up. I'm like, you know what? That's a shot. Might as well go for it. And so I show up at the O'Neill Center the next day and he goes, all right, put on the headset. Game starts in 10 minutes. Hope you're ready. And I go, hope I'm ready for what? And goes, you're going to be color commentator. And, and keep in mind, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. And at the time, I didn't know anything about basketball. So, you know, Chris is there. He's doing his thing. He's a super knowledgeable guy. And, uh, he, and, and like, the first couple plays happen. West Con goes up by, like, three or four. And he goes, all right, Nick, break that down for us because you can see I was struggling. And my very first ever call was something to the effect of, yeah, she was wide open. She had the ball. She shot and scored. And that that was it and it mm -hmm. was a disaster he looked at me like i had five heads and he was like what did i get myself into dragging this amateur on the scene with me uh and after that like he became sort of like a mentor to me if you will uh you know, he took me into the radio station 
uh, and you know, he just explained to me this is how we do things around here. It Westcon is not uh, Syracuse, it's not Hofstra, Fordham, uh, URI, which has you know bigger sports broadcasting programs. The sports department, big air quotes around that, was three guys, two seniors, and me that just loved watching sports and loved hearing ourselves talk. Uh, so you know, we put on the headsets and we talked about the games. And then when they graduated, they were like, all right, Nick, you're the sports director. Have fun with this. And I had no idea what was going to happen after that. Um, I was fortunate that there was three or four or five freshmen that came in in the following mm -hmm. fall, uh, one of them being actually Andrew Coker, who, who you had on a couple weeks ago at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he joined the team. Um, we went through the football season. We went through the basketball season and then into the summer, you know, baseball season with the Westerners, that sort of deal. And, you know, just kind of kept working our way up. Eventually, I became the news director, which I kind of I kind of commandeered that title, actually, more than, like, earned it or anything, because there was no news director at the time at the right. station. Uh, and then, eventually, the general manager, who was a really good friend of mine, Marcelo, he's like, I'm going to Belgium for a semester. Nick, you're going to be general manager. And that's how I ended up uh, in a leadership position. Wow. And... <laughs> then I, then, <laughs> right uh and then i graduated and now i'm here on a sports talk show with the one and only jack oh. like you could say my career is going pretty well it, it, right that's awesome and i didn't even realize how uh quickly you became the sports director that was your sophomore year correct correct yes what were some of the challenges that you faced being in that position with um you know, really a relatively newer program that hadn't seen a lot of footprints in it. What were some of the challenges there? It was a matter of learning how to do this thing on my own, right? Because my experience was listening to professional broadcasts and then kind of standing behind Chris and Kyle, who were the two sports broadcasters of my first semester there before they graduated. And then the bigger, the bigger challenge was then teaching others how to do it, hmm. right? Because it's one thing to put on the headset and talk about basketball, talk about football, because you know it. It's much more difficult, as I'm sure you know, to have that to have a conversation with someone else about it, learn other people's cadences, learn about what's interesting to talk about and what's boring and the important information you get out there and what's not, and then just managing everyone that's part of your team right i went from you know getting myself to the game to now i have to manage four or five people you know who does the games who's on what role that sort of thing how difficult was it for uh, you to make those decisions oh i want uh jim to be on the broadcast i want joe to be on this broadcast what was that process like for you was it a difficult process did it take long or was it kind of a, a random crapshoot if you will it wasn't uh, especially difficult, I would say, uh, right? I would say, hey, guys, we got a football game this Friday. Um, I was always play-by-play -play because that's the most fun for me. I like to talk fast, and I like to talk about the action. So I was like, all right, if unless any of you really is, like, dying to do play-by-play, -play, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. And, and to be honest, I mean, they, they never really did. Like, I'm mm -hmm. not just saying that because I always took the role. I'm saying that because I would ask them, and they would go, yeah, no, I think Andrew tried it once. Um, didn't, didn't go perfectly, uh, but that's a story for another time. Um, and, and then it was just a matter of, okay, so what, what is your expertise? Are you good at doing analysis of a play? Are you going to sit down, you know, after you do your homework and after, you know, uh, you get your work, like work, work done for the day, are you going to mm -hmm. sit down and break down a team? So that way, you know, the facts coming in, do you know your stats about the quarterback? Do you know what kind of defense they like to play that sort of deal? Or is, is it a matter of, are you going to sit on the sidelines? Are you going to find interesting people to interview at halftime, that sort of deal. And everyone sort of had a sense of what they wanted to do. I'd say we had like three regular people, myself, Andrew was a regular, and then we had one more. His name was Sean Johnson, who was a regular. Mm -hmm. um, so Sean took on that role of sideline duty. Andrew was more the the color commentator, and then I was just play by play, where I just yelled everyone's ear off. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. So you worked your way up. I know you mentioned news director. Then you made it to general manager. 
you, it didn't sound like you had a whole lot of time to plan or mentally prepare yourself for that role. And that can be a challenging role uh, for any college student, a senior, junior, doesn't matter. It's, it's a lot of responsibility. How did you handle that position and, and how did you adapt to such a quick turnaround like that? So what I tried to do with that role was learn from where the previous general managers had failed. Um, and, and I say failed, and that sounds harsh, but it, it's not hard. By failed, I mean they took on too much. Uh, mm -hmm. The WXCI station is relatively small. I think when I graduated, we had maybe 20 to 25 people there, whether they were on-air talent or they wanted to be DJs or they were making content, that sort of thing behind the scenes. When I joined, it was, that number was closer to like five or six. So again, we're not talking like a full-time staff to manage. But the general manager tended to take on the most work because they were, you know, the, the quote unquote president of the club. So what I decided I was going to do was I wasn't going to stress myself out. I was going to delegate the work. I was going to use my executive board. I was going to say, OK, you want to have this project, right? One of the projects being this uh, fall, uh, this spring festival where we bring in bands and we have bouncy houses and balloon stuff going on. And there's food and everything. You guys want to do this? OK, bring your ideas to the e-board and the e-board will help you do the project instead of me mapping it out and me planning the budget and me going to the vendors and, and finding the bands and all that, which is where in the past the other general general managers, they try to take on all that responsibility. So it was, it was a role more of delegation and having that, I guess, authority and learning leadership as opposed to going out and doing everything the station needed. If you guys have any questions, comments, want to participate in the chat, feel free. We'd be happy to shout them out, Nick. Uh, do you have a favorite position, a favorite title that you held uh, with WXCI? Uh, I really enjoyed being the general manager, actually, um, because <laughs> for very selfish reasons, it's the one sort of position that stands out more to employers now, right? They mm -hmm. look at my resume and they go, oh, general manager, what'd you do? And I get to tell that story over and over again. Um, it, it was fun being in the know with everyone, right? As general manager, I still got to do sports stuff. I still got to have a radio show. It's not like I had to forfeit those things mm -hmm. because, because I was the, the president. Uh, but it was also nice sort of being the go-to guy, right? If there's an issue in the station, I hear about it and I get to start making that plan as opposed to being... I guess, uh, a foot soldier and being told, all right, here's what's happening. Here's how we're going to deal with it. Yeah, I, I would agree with you because I, I sat in that same chair um, about two and a half hours east of you. And mm -hmm. it, it was definitely the most rewarding uh, because you were able to influence so many different people. And it wasn't just sports. And, and uh, I felt the same way in that I wasn't going to take the position if it cut down on my ability to get on the air and broadcast and have my talk show and have all these other things that made that experience right. so right. great. So I think that's where it really gets important. Now, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, it. You have been in a position, and you could agree on this, being on the radio, being on the air like we are now, it's an act of performance, if you will. You've been around <laughs> performing a while. You were the st one of the huge stagehands and managers uh, during the uh, musicals at New Milford High, and you were also right. the mascot. <laughs> I knew you were going to work that in. I had to. I was trying to find a way, and I found it. Oh, my God. You were the mascot. Tell I was us. the mascot for one afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> That was I, all they needed to see before they gave it to somebody else. <laughs> I wanted to, and I didn't know, uh, I didn't really know that it was you until you actually spoke, like the cardinal sin, you're not supposed to speak in the mascot outfit, but there he is, Nick Del Mastro. That's not actually him in the photo, it's probably a few <laughs> years behind, but um, uh did you enjoy that day or did you just say, get me out of this thing? I'm done. I don't want to be in it. So looking back, I should have enjoyed it more. I should have enjoyed the anonymity. 
uh, of mm -hmm. it. I should have I should have enjoyed just the stuff I could have done, the wacky things. But at the time in high school, I was not quite um, as socially blossomed as I am mm -hmm. now. Let's say right. I was still a little bit more reserved and shy. So. You know, when they said cheer on the tug of war team, I was standing behind them cheering them on instead of like, you know, getting involved and messing around like the mascot does. But um, I think you're one of like three people that would actually ever remember that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good then, right? Is that a no. good thing? <laughs> I well, I just exposed it. To, <laughs> I've just exposed it to everyone watching so that they, they can now understand. Um, but it's in the past, right? It's not a huge... Mm. Right, right. <laughs> um, so you also had uh, you spent a significant amount of time working with the local radio station in the greater uh, Brookfield, Danbury, New Milford area uh, with Town Square Media Group and, and working with I-95 and, as well as uh, WINE, the sports station there. How was that experience for you? What was that like? It was incredibly eye-opening to go from a college scene to a professional scene because they are just worlds apart, hmm. uh, right? The college scene was, at least for WXCI, it was, you know, you show up in the broadcast booth with a laptop where you have a two hour Spotify playlist of the things you want to play. You run a PSA every half hour, you talk to the fans, you have some banter, the fans, the audience, you banter with your co-host, that sort of thing, then you leave for the week. With, with WINE and I-95, it was definitely more like market-faced, if you will. Every day I was writing two or three articles relating to sports. That's what they brought me in to do, was to get in touch with the local sports area. Uh, it was summer when I did, it was a summer internship, so I was focused mostly on the Westerners. But I reached out to um, Sacred Heart University, Western Connecticut State University, uh, Eastern Connecticut State University, and I even tried to get in touch with UConn to see if they would send me anything. They never did because they never heard of me. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just a matter of keeping up with the, the news that seems relatively small. Like, oh, hey, our swim and dive team won first place or they, they beat this other small school you never heard of and then trying to make an article out of that. And occasionally I had a good article. There was a night uh, last year where the Westerners won their opening day game on a walk-off home run. Mm. That was the best article I wrote all year because it was just the most exciting thing. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was – I never got to go on air myself. Everything I did was pre-recorded, and it was all promos for my show. It was 30 seconds. Make sure to tune in to the Sports Minute coming up in half an hour, like that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I never got to play music. I never got to, like, actually talk sports with anyone. Um, right? But I was also just the lowly intern they put in the back corner for, you know, four hours. But still, that experience, I think, is so rewarding. You know, mm -hmm. it's one thing to have your own hands-on ability, but to actually be uh, in the professional setting, uh, even if you're the intern in the back corner, you're still there. You're mm -hmm. still, you know, making a mark. Uh, it could be a small little blip, but it's a mark. Don't get me wrong. I am in no way complaining about this. I would mm -hmm. be forever grateful for the connections I've made and just the people I got to work with around there. I got to meet the, the, the morning host shows that I listened to driving to school every day in high school, Ethan and Lou in the morning. Like it was just that and that was just kind of mind boggling. And now I know all the behind the scenes, too. And I also kind of learned that maybe it's not for me if things are becoming more and more automated in the radio industry maybe I want to, you know, focus more on a television career or whatever, right? Movie industry, that sort of thing. I think that's great. I think it's a, a wide background. I think the experience is great. And I wish you the best, man. I think the sky's the limit. You've uh, you. you've done some really good things in uh, throughout your college career. Now, I wanted to shift our focus uh, to everything that's going on in our world <laughs> oh right oh now. only that huh? <laughs> but in the sporting world obviously you're a huge yankees guy mm -hmm. you have that knowledge that background there uh they're up against the red Sox tonight but before that the mlb is undergoing one of the scariest things 
that they could do this season, and that is have multiple teams come out with multiple players and team personnel with COVID-19 cases. I just want to think, and this is a running poll now here on Twitch, vote in the poll about your opinion. Do you think that the cancellation of the MLB season is imminent now after we've seen these couple of uh, outbreaks? Oh, you don't need a poll for this. The MLB is doomed. MLB is doomed this year. It's We're up to what, five teams now? Four or five teams? Marlins, Phillies, Cardinals now. And I think it was Nationals that have all come out with at least one player that tested mm-hmm. positive. And you got to think, you know, these teams, they've all tested positive. Where have they played? Right? Um, I think it was the, the Cardinals played in Minnesota. So now Minnesota has to be worried about mm-hmm. their players and the teams that have played there since the Nationals played. Uh, right, I don't know their schedule off the top of my head, but the 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 amount of backlog there is in cases, there are in cases, I'm not sure which, it's just, that has to be very concerning. Right now, Cleveland's, pl- Cleveland's playing there tonight. Their game's still on over at Minnesota. Are the Cleveland Indians, like, not sitting on the benches? Are they not leaning on the rails? Are they all wearing their masks and gloves, like, like in the dark? Like, how do you go to an away stadium when an opposing team who had just played there said, oh, by the way, you know, two, three people have the virus. I think this is going to explode. Oh, not only over the weekend, but in the next week, we're going to see a lot more cases. I think it's going to get shut down. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm with you on this. It's a problem that could have been resolved before it happened. Um, and you're just seeing how... Uh, important the bubble is and it sounds dumb and the nba players were frustrated with it because of the limitations and the restrictions but there are none right now with the major leaguers and you're seeing the negative results of that you're seeing these outbreaks and i think the uh the ripple effect if you will the butterfly effect that's happening now that you mentioned is a hundred percent true it has to be a point of concern for this league. And of course, Rob Memfred uh, made the statement earlier today that the, the entire league and players need to focus on, on following protocols and staying safer. Um, do you have a shelf life for this uh, before you see an ultimate cancellation of the season? Do you know how long it's going to be? Do you have a prediction there? Like I said, I think in the next week, we're going to see... Explosion is a very uh, volatile word to use mm. here, but I'm going to say because it sounds good, we're going to see an explosion of cases. We might hit a hundred, right? Think think about just the, the way teams travel. Think about how this virus spreads and and dugouts and the base paths and the trains and the planes and the buses. They're just cesspools for this. And like you said, there's very very relaxed restrictions on what players can and can't do in the MLB I I think if we see like at least three more teams come out and say oh by the way you know our our relievers all got sick right two of our relievers tested positive uh-huh. you're gonna see that get shut down because it's not the it's not the number of cases that should be concerning well most concerning should be the number of cases let me let me walk that statement back yeah but also the reshuffling of schedules, right? The Yankees and the Orioles got lucky, I think, in their reshuffle that they could just play each other, right? Because both of their opponents got canceled in the Marlins and the, the Phillies. But what happens when, you know, you lose the NL Central, right? The Cardinals and the Pirates can't play. And also, oh, by the way, in the NL West, the Rockies and the Diamondbacks can't play, right? Like all of a sudden you're down from, from your normal 100% of teams that can play, right? We already lost four. How many do you lose before it's just, oh, there's 10 teams that can play each other left, right? I, I, and I don't know. I don't, I don't see the season going the distance. I don't know if it's going to be this week or next week, but I have a feeling it's going to get called off. Yeah, you have to be pessimistic at this point, I think. And it's unfortunate because they were doing so well with what they had, right? We see everyone's excited about baseball coming back. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of runs down this this pattern and this path, and and you just kind of have to shake your head and say, uh, what can they do to to make it better? Because it's in the players' hands now. 
you know mm-hmm. they're the ones that are that are doing this thing the owners they organize this thing maybe they have to go out and put some more uh protocols in place hey you can only do this that and the other thing um but that's like how do you manage that when when guys are leaving the ballpark going home how do you tell them what to do and what they can't do it's it's a it's a really impossible solution to find right you can't play fast and loose with the virus because as soon as it finds its way in if it finds the slightest crack it's gonna explode we we've seen zero examples in the real world of this being contained well and i don't know why the sports world thought that they could do better or at least the major league thought they could do better well, one league that is uh, celebrating as they are officially back is the ah, see? NBA. See how I set that up for you? Right yeah, there? <laughs> you like that? Uh, well, that's a little tag team effort there. Um, you, and we talked about this a little bit before the show started, are a avid Lakers fan. Yes. They uh, are a huge potential to win the finals this year. They are a favorite to win it. Not the favorite. Are they the favorite this year? I don't know. I think the I think most people might still say the Clippers would be more favorite than the Lakers. I know the Bucks were up there. I know that that would be, probably be my matchup. Would be the Bucks and the Lakers in the finals. And it just feels weird counting out like the Celtics. But I but. You know, based on, right, that's just one of those things, like, that's like saying the Yankees aren't going to do well in the major league. That just sounds weird to say. I think that the Celtics are, like, a half step behind where they should be right now. I don't know what it is. I I love Brad Stevens as a head coach. Uh, Jason Tatum, people forget he's still 20 years old, 19 years old, however old he is. He's still one of the youngest, brightest stars in, in the entire NBA. People forget that. Uh, they have an all NBA point guard in Kemba Walker. I just think that they're a step behind um, everything else. I think you give it a year for the Celtics and they're good. But I wanted to ask you, mm. what is in the way of the Lakers winning the NBA Finals this year? Uh, the Lakers are in the way of the Lakers winning the NBA Finals this year. Uh, I think that's sort of been the case for the past couple years with them is they will get in their own way, whether it's relying entirely on LeBron or relying too little on him, if that even makes sense. Right when he came to the team, I forget when that was that two years ago already. Yeah, this is his second full season. Right when he came to the team, everyone thought the the, the Lakers plan was going to be feed LeBron, mm-hmm. right? Get him the ball every play. And they tried that. And it didn't work. And then last year, it was sort of the opposite, where, yes, he's still involved, but he's not the leader per se, right? They're still trying to find an identity. This year, it seems better. They're they're definitely spreading the ball out more. It's not the LeBron James show, even though he does put on a show. Um, right? There's, there's so many more weapons to cover. They've really come into their own identity. It's a matter of sustaining it. And this season, they've done a real good job sustaining it. Connor Sure, what's up, buddy? Thanks for the comment. Appreciate it. Appreciate your support. J. Russell Nolan says the seven inning double headers uh, that the MLB has scheduled aren't a great indication of where the league is headed. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, I was thinking about that earlier today. I think it makes more sense in the scheme of we have 60 games to play as opposed to the regular 168. Um, it is 168 still, right? 162. I, I, I'm sorry? 162. 162. All right. I can never keep up. <laughs> I'm the sports guy, right? Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, use your Twitch Prime, subscribe to Jack O'Mara, not to make up. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, right, it, it's a matter of just condensing. Right? You still get your games, but now you also have more time for travel and more time for taking the precautions i think i don't fully understand the seven inning double headers um it it might just be like that sense of urgency Mm -hmm. that teams are feeling right everything is shorter 
right? Your team may not play the full 60 games if they're like the Marlins or like now the Brewers or the Nationals or whoever, right? They might only get to play 55. But if they do have to play a doubleheader at the end of the season, you know, if there is a season, right, let's keep it shorter. That way when we jump into playoffs, if there's a playoffs, right, you can't say you're at a disadvantage because you had to play two nine-inning games Oh, now you had to play four nine-inning games in the same time as another team would just play two nine-inning games. Does that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think it's it's a tricky position because the season's already as short as it is. And now you're shortening important games. Double headers are important. You know, you, you, mm-hmm. you get hot one game, you can continue that into the next game. If you shorten it up, it might restrict your ability to get hot, to get there in the first place. Right. Uh, it, I understand why they're rushing it. I understand they they don't want to keep the guys out there forever. They want to make sure that the um, you know as, as many opportunities to get the virus as to and to try to keep the players safe. I think that's the goal. Mm-hmm. But a lot of concerns and question marks from the league right now. So uh, Nick, it was a pleasure having you on the air uh, on it the was- show today more than a pleasure being on and let me just say something right now you got if it you're on facebook live watching the captain jack show you are watching it wrong you should be over on twitch.tv oh. forward slash captain jack uh sorry forward slash cpt underscore america o- america Is yes that what yeah yeah right and then what you got to do and be and i know everyone has amazon prime is you got to hit the little subscribe icon and use that twitch prime Oof. To watch in the true glory of what Captain Jack can bring. You're you're on the wrong platform right now. And if you are on Twitch and there are several people watching right now and you don't hit that subscribe button, I'm telling you, you're missing out on the full content. You're the man. And I wish they could. Actually, I can't. You know, this is an interesting thing. You can't subscribe yet to me because I'm not an affiliate yet. All right. Well, then. Hold on. Hold on. on. We have to hit the twitch.com i'm talking to you right now <laughs> just me and you let me let me just sit you down in the corner here this man is putting his heart and soul oh. into his broadcast and he has done so with every project that i've seen since we made pretzels back in the seventh grade eighth grade of uh Scott-a-Coke middle school so please by all means give him the little blue twitter check mark next to his name okay thanks twitch all right do we end with that oh we had the uh the um cooking teacher she had the the Finger that was um, yes. missing. Yes. Wow. Uh, hunting. Hunting. So many so many memories Oof. of school you're bringing up tonight, Jack. Oh, man. Bringing I back was... some flashbacks that you probably don't want to think about too often, huh? I just distinctly <laughs> remember you coming into class after saying the Pledge of Allegiance on the intercom and going, I'm going to say, instead of America, I'm going to say America, and being so proud of yourself for it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think now, going back, I, I probably could get tried for treason uh, <laughs> for doing that. But it was Scattercook Middle School. What are you going to do? Uh, Nick, where can the fine folks of Twitch and Facebook uh, find you on the interwebs? Uh, I guess the most active I am is on Twitter. And that is, I don't even know. I think I have like seven followers, so I don't think it really even matters. Uh, it's at Nicholas, the full name, but the name I get called when I'm in trouble, Del Mass Zero, because I'm real clever. Uh, I mostly tweet about stupid things, a lot of video game stuff, um, because I'm into that sort of thing, uh, <laughs> and Yankee stuff. I'm just scrolling through what I have going on now. And then, you know, Facebook, Reddit, YouTube, that sort of thing. Just search up Nick Del Mastro and don't don't believe the uh, the stories of me that are the the lawyer because I'm not the lawyer, Nick. I'm the starving artist, Nick. <laughs> Is there a lawyer named Nick Del Mastro? And people there's think that's... actually several Nicholas Del Mastros in the world, and I'm glad I'm the one that I am, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Well, then, well, we will keep it there. And uh, I just did retweet you, uh, Nick, your last tweet, so everyone can go follow him. Again, course, it is a it's, pleasure it's having you. He's shilling for you, so, yeah, it's going to be the one you're retweeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, reach, I'll just go down the list and uh, 
and Just everything wow. back to like two thousand. You know, the, actually, and this is the last little story before I, I go because sure. I know I, well, I've run over your normal guest. Time. No, it's okay. It's fine. The reason I made a Twitter was back when I was up at Syracuse. We had an English class where we had to send a tweet, and. I jokingly made this Twitter, and I jokingly sent a tweet to the at-then presidential candidate, Donald Trump, and he retweeted it. Wow. Or someone on his social media team retweeted it, and I thought it was the funniest thing. And then we got to November, and the rest is history. But (laughs) What was it, if you don't mind me asking, what did you say? I think it was something like, this tweet is for English class. I want to see what happens at Donald Trump or whatever. Wow. And it was just like retweeted like 20 minutes later. And I had a laughing fit in class because (laughs) of (laughs) That's incredible. You can write that on your Twitter bio. I don't know how many people would be happy with it. I'm Um, not going to write that on my Twitter bio. (laughs) (laughs) Because I know a lot of people wouldn't be happy with it. Oh, personal accomplishment. Maybe one you don't brag about at parties, right? Absolutely. Absolutely not. Well, Nick, it was a pleasure having you on, my friend. Thank you so much for taking the time. And we appreciate your support as always, brother. It was more than a pleasure me being here. Let me know next time your guests cancel because I was the third choice, by the way. Oh, no, you were – well, what happened was, and I'm working still to get this guest. He just didn't get back to me. I'd offered him the Friday slot. He said, I'll let you know. So I didn't want to run and jump and give it to you. But, hey, look at – Okay, sure, sure, Everything happens for a reason. Whatever you say, Jack, on there. (laughs) Anyways, uh, congratulations on your move out to Rhode Island. Thank you. Uh, I know you're going to thrive out there. Make sure to post lots of beach pictures on your oh, Instagram. I oh, I will. Island Make living, baby. Make jealous. <laughs> All right, man. Enjoy your evening. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks for coming on. You as well.